thank you all for, uh, for, for having me and, and Dan for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, I, I'm going to tell a slightly different sort of story. And, and what I want you to think about is not necessarily genetics to actually predict some of the phenotypic variability in drug response, but rather genetics is actually a starting point for drug discovery. And so David actually talked about it in his talk. Uh, the more that we learn about human genetics, the more that we're reaching these therapeutic dead ends. And I think the story that I want to tell you today is about how we can actually use human genetics to start that drug discovery process. So, so let me kind of start by framing this in, in maybe a slightly different way, which is think about yourself, not necessarily as a human geneticist, but think about yourself who's doing drug discovery. And the problem that we actually face in the drug discovery industry is, is the following. Um, first, the cost of getting one drug approved continues to go up and up and up. Um, and there are various numbers that are actually cited, but the bottom line is it's expensive, upwards of $2 billion per approved drug, and the costs are continuing to go up, as shown here, uh, by nearly 70% over the last uh, seven years. Um, and so I'm going to refer to this as the attrition problem, and I'll spend a few minutes on it. Um, but it's even worse than that, that the drugs that were actually developed, that were delivering into the real world, are delivering less and less value to patients. And one way you can actually quantify that is actually the peak sales of the drugs that are actually approved, and these to continue to go down and down and down. So the cost of drug discovery is getting more and more expensive, but there's this innovation problem as well. And I want to just spend a few minutes on the attrition problem, because I think that's fundamental to the argument that I want to make. So think about where things go wrong in the drug discovery process. What you're looking at here off to the far left is the very beginning of a drug discovery campaign. You have a target, you have a pathway, and you want to make a drug against it. Uh, let's say about 30 molecules or 30 targets start that particular journey. And then as you go closer and closer to the clinic and say phase one, you, you whittle that down uh, to about 10 that actually start a phase one clinical trial. And then over the course of phase one to phase two and phase three, you have various levels of success, ultimately leading to, to one approved uh, drug. And so about one out of 10 uh, drugs that actually starts in a clinical trial program at phase one ultimately makes it to approval. And what's important about this is, is not necessarily just the numbers, but actually where those dollars are spent. So about for every $1 that's spent in the preclinical stage, you spend about $3 um, in, the, uh, in the clinical phase. And that's actually working on fewer and fewer programs. And so it's the expense, actually, and the failures in phase two and phase three that are really drivers of this cost. Okay, so then if you actually dig deeper into that problem and ask, why are things failing in phase two and in phase three? And if you step, step back and think about it, despite five to seven years of preclinical modeling, a tremendous amount of information that actually goes into designing a phase one study, still over 50% of things that are actually failing in phase two are failing because they just don't work. That number goes up even more into phase three failures where it's nearly two-thirds of drugs that are failing in phase three are failing because they just don't work. So it's a reminder of the complexity of human biology that we're actually facing. So the key point here is that the decisions that are made at the very beginning of this drug discovery process, the very beginning of this journey, are really having a very strong influence on the success in the later stages of drug discovery. And this is where I think human genetics can actually have a very, very substantial impact. Um, so there are a number of different ways to think about genetics and drug discovery. I'm going to provide you with one model, which is a solution to how to think about this problem. And I'll actually build on some of the, the discussion points that, um, that David had in his, in his previous talk. And so the way I like to think about it is that it used to be, as we thought about a drug discovery campaign, we relied very heavily on preclinical animal models to select the targets that we wanted to pursue. Maybe there was a knockout uh, animal that led to a particular phenotype, and we decided to make a drug against that particular target. And then we actually delivered drugs into patients that were really unselected. And so this is where the, some of the themes that you've touched upon here already in terms of pharmacogenetics will actually uh, uh, play out. So this is the way that much of drug discovery was actually done. But I think you've, you've already heard quite a bit about this over the last day and a half, that this, this paradigm is changing. And increasingly, we're using humans as the model organism of choice. We're using humans, whether it be from, from genetic observations or other uh, causal human biology uh, uh, information, to make choices as to which targets we should pursue 
along this drug discovery journey. This is not to say that preclinical animals are not important. In fact, you actually heard very good examples from David just now about how we should actually use these preclinical models to understand the biological consequences of human genetic mutations and also to actually understand the pharmacology of the molecules uh, and to guide dose and, and, and schedule before going into humans. Um, but the other important part of this diagram is that actually as we go into humans, we shouldn't be going into unselected patient populations. We should be going into very very specific subsets of patients that are defined by the underlying genetics of the target or the underlying biology of the target. And so I think an important theme that I want to get across to this particular group is that as we think about pharmacogenetics as a community, I think the biggest impact that genetics is going to actually have and ultimately pharmacogenetics is not going to take drugs that exist in the real world today and finding genetic factors that tailor it to the right patients. That will happen. We should always look for it. That's going to be important. But I think the biggest impact that genetics will actually have and ultimately pharmacogenetics is when we start the drug discovery journey with a very specific genetic hypothesis and that's carried all the way through into the biomarkers that we choose in terms of the clinical trials that we actually design and ultimately the patients that we treat in, in the real world. Um, so let me, let me just build on this model a, a, bit, a bit more um, because I think lots of people say, well, well, we'll use human genetics, we'll find these drug targets, and then voila, we'll actually have this, this wealth of new drugs. And, and of course, it's far more complicated than that. And I think one way to think about it is, is, is putting on a graph um, function and phenotype, where human phenotype is along the y-axis, gene function is along the x-axis, and you can think about this very much in the same way you think about a dose response curve. Now, if you think about how we actually do a genetic association study or a genetic discovery program, you know, the first step is we pick a human phenotype, and I think you have to pick a human phenotype that is a good surrogate for drug discovery. You heard yesterday from, from Matt Nelson uh, about um, his wonderful work and how to think about genetics and drug discovery. And in his paper from a few years ago, he looked at a number of different phenotypes that, that are, are actually quite good surrogates for, for, um, for efficacy in a drug discovery study. And I won't go through them here, but a list is actually shown on this slide. So once you believe that a phenotype is actually a good drug discovery phenotype, you then need to find those alleles that are influencing those traits. Ideally, you'll find not just a single allele, but you'll actually find multiple alleles. Those alleles could be common, they could be rare. The frequency is less important, but as long as you can actually make a really unambiguous association between the genotype and a clinical phenotype, and ideally have a range of effect sizes for those variants itself. But then you have to do the dirty work of getting into the lab and understanding the consequences of function. And this, I think, is re really one of the major bottlenecks that we're actually facing today. So understanding, are those variants gain of function? Are they loss of function? What are they truly doing to the target? What is that mechanism um, that we need to modulate uh, with a drug to achieve a pharmacologic effect? Um, and this will then not only have a range of effect sizes in terms of phenotypes, but also a range of effect sizes as it pertains to biological function. But I think genetics has a, a very important property, which I think is often underappreciated. You can actually take those same alleles and understand the pleiotropic consequences, much in the way that you actually can think about the side effects, the on-target side effects of drugs. And so you can now use human genetics to assess pleiotropy um, as uh, proxies for uh, adverse drug events. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes when I describe FIWAS. Um, and again, if you have a target with a range of alleles, a range of clinical effects, and you understand what that, uh, those clinical effects are, not just only on the, on the phenotype you think is of, of interest for, drug, for, 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 for a clinical trial, but also potential adverse effects, effects. This, again, is a starting point for a drug discovery journey. Um, and so a point that comes up again and again is common versus rare. <laughs> and I just, just want to say that I don't think it's common or rare. It's really common and rare. It's really about having a deep understanding of the variance the influence on clinical phenotype and influence on gene function. I think rare variants are incredibly important because often those effect sizes are larger, and I think human knockout phenotypes in particular are incredibly valuable because it tells you the maximum effect that you can actually have on a drug target and the phenotypic consequences. But I also think common variants are actually quite important as well because it often gives you more kind of subtle, uh, more subtle understanding of, of a biological perturbation of a target and the effects that you actually might see in the clinic. And as you'll also see, as I describe in a couple of examples, the ability to select indications for a drug of interest. 
So I'm going to go over one example in human immunology, and then I'm going to talk about two emerging resources, Men Mendelian randomization and protein quantitative trait loci, and then phenome-wide association studies, or FIWAS. Um, so the first example is uh, an example of this allelic series model. Um, it's for a gene, um, a TIC2. Um, TIC2, as I'll show you, is an intracellular signaling molecule that's downstream of another, a number of um, cytokine receptors. Um, if you knock it out completely, and there are human knockouts, uh, this is associated with immunodeficiency and an increased risk of infection. Um, there are also common uh, protein coding alleles um, that uh, influence TIC2 function, and, and these have been shown to be protective for a variety of autoimmune diseases. I'll focus on psoriasis, but they're also associated with protection from RA and lupus and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and as I'll show you, those same common alleles actually do not increase risk of infection. So while the complete human knockout increases risk of infection, these partial loss of function mutations that protect from autoimmunity have no obvious increased risk of infection, which suggests that there's this therapeutic window that might be valuable for, for a druggable target. So just to tell you a little bit about the target and the pathway, and actually as it pertains to psoriasis. Um, so there are, are um, uh, IL-12 and 23, um, these ligands can come together and bind to a receptor, um, and that's shown here, the IL-23 receptor, and then the IL-12 subunit. Um, and they signal then through these intracellular signaling molecules, one of which is TIC2, uh, another is JAK2. What's pretty amazing to me, at least, is that the genome-wide association studies for psoriasis have identified at least four components of this signaling complex as implicated in risk of psoriasis. So the, the gene IL-23A, another gene IL-12B, the receptor IL-23R, and then, as I'll describe, TIC2 itself. I think what also is quite interesting is that at least two of the extracellular components of this have been shown to be effective drug targets in terms of treating psoriasis, and the IL-23 P19 inhibitors in particular have shown very remarkable efficacy. And this then leads to the question as, if you were actually to inhibit TIC2, uh, would that be therapeutically beneficial? Um, this is a study that was published just uh, recently by Shomari Shadri and colleagues in Nature Genetics, um, and it fine maps um, a number of different regions, um, including TIC2, uh, for both rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes. And I'll use this a couple of times in the talk because I thought it was a very nice study. Um, but what they actually did was do use deep fine mapping to find the underlying causal alleles. And just to highlight one, which is P1104A, as you can see that this is a relatively low frequency variant, about 3% in individuals of, um, of, of European ancestry. Um, but it has a pretty substantial uh, protective effect on risk of, in this case, RA and type 1 diabetes, but as I'll also show you in psoriasis and other autoimmune diseases. Um, but there are multiple alleles that also are protective. Another one is also a protein coding variant, um, I684S. Um, it's a slightly more frequent uh, variant with a smaller effect in terms of uh, uh, protection from autoimmunity. And there's a third variant, which is not shown here, which is even more rare, but also a protein coding variant. All of these are predicted to be loss of function. All of these have been shown to actually protect from autoimmune diseases. So now you can actually use this as a tool. This is a phenomenal tool that you can actually now probe in the ways that I've just described of the impact on gene function, but also the impact on pleiotropy. And I'll just walk you through this. Um, this was a paper published a few years ago by Callie Dendrew and colleagues, um, published in Science Translational Medicine, um, to actually explore the genotype phenotype consequences of this one variant. P1104A, and what they actually did was a series of very elegant functional studies where they showed that carriers of this particular mutation actually had defects in signaling, shown here for defects in signaling through interferon alpha, but also they showed defects in signaling when the activation was through IL-12 or IL-23. And what's really important to the story is not just that it has a functional effect but the magnitude of the functional effect. So they showed via these assays that there was about an 80% loss of TIC2 function when measured in patients who carry these different alleles. And that's shown by the figure here for CD4 positive naive T cells. Okay. Then they also took that exact same variant and they went to the UK Biobank, and we've actually done this for other, um, uh, and other biobanks as well, including uh, Partners Healthcare and with Vanderbilt and working with 23andMe as well. But what they showed here for UK Biobank is that variant, 
is actually not associated with an increased risk of infection. So it's, yes, it's associated with protectum for the autoimmune diseases that I described, but there's no obvious increased risk for infection. So what this tells you now as a therapeutic hypothesis that about 80% loss of function of TIC2 activity should protect from autoimmune disease but not increase risk of, of infection. Okay. Um, here is showing that it's not just protecting from risk of, of RA and type 1 diabetes and psoriasis, but a range of autoimmune diseases as shown on the top, including ankylosing spondylitis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and MS. But you'll notice that I actually am showing you one of the variants I described at the very beginning, and the reason for that is that a second variant has a slightly more complicated pattern. It looks like it protects from several diseases, including psoriasis and RA, but it may increase risk of other autoimmune diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. But taking this example, you now have this risk-benefit curve, so this function phenotype map, where you can actually say, again, complete loss of function increases risk of infection. So you now know if you develop a drug, you don't want to completely inhibit tic 2 its function. But then 80% loss of function looks like it protects from autoimmunity. It has uh, an immunologic phenotype, but is not associated with risk of infection. And we've seen that from the UK Biobank study. Wrong button. Okay. Um, so the therapeutic hypothesis is that partial inhibition of about 80% will protect from autoimmunity but not increase risk of infection. Okay. So this is another theme to me which is just incredibly important. And it's not necessarily obvious, um, but as I've done drug discovery more and more since moving from academics into industry, it's to me one of the biggest challenges that we face, which is to take that therapeutic hypothesis and find a modality, a therapeutic modality which matches the mechanism of interest. And the reason this has been so challenging for TIC2 is because a traditional kinase inhibitor, which binds and inactivates the kinase site, so what's called an orthosteric inhibitor, that pocket is highly conserved across a number of different enzymes, including other JAKs. So there have been a number of different companies which have tried to actually develop TIC2 inhibitors, and they failed because they can't get selectivity, but they failed because they focus on that, on that kinase domain. Um, and so about a couple of years ago, um, BMS published a study which really unlocked, I think, this area of biology. They took this observation that TIC2 function in these different immune cell types um, has a biological effect, and, we wanted, and they wanted to mimic that. And they actually created an assay which was based upon a phenotypic screen. So rather than trying to develop a biochemical inhibitor that was against the kinase function itself, they broadened the search to say, we want to actually look for a phenotypic, we want to use a phenotypic screen to find an inhibitor of TIC2, but we want to be a bit more open-ended as to how that molecule works. It doesn't necessarily have to bind to the kinase domain. It could bind to other sites, including allosteric sites. And they were successful at this process. So what they found was that they found a molecule, and I'll tell you in just a minute, it bound to a pseudokinase domain, which had an, ortho, had an allosteric effect on enzymatic function. And what they could show was that with a molecule that was highly potent, you could get 80% or more inhibition of TIC2 without having any inhibition of the other JAK, so JAK1, JAK2, and JAK3. Um, the other JAKs are important because they increase risk of infection, and they also have hematologic consequences as well. Okay. Um, this is a model of, the, um, uh, of TIC2 itself, and what I'm showing you here in orange is the site of the kinase domain, which is the orthosteric inhibitor, um, and this is the site of the mutation. Um, but what they found was that a molecule bound to a different site that may not have been predicted um, you know, from a straightforward understanding of, of, the, of the gene's function um, led to dramatic inhibition and also, importantly, selectivity um, over, um, uh, over uh, the, the JAK inhibitors. So, so this story is fine, and I've actually been telling the story for a number of years, but what actually to me was quite remarkable was the publication just a few weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine which showed that this idea actually works. And so what BMS did is they took this TIC2 inhibitor that I just described, they went into psoriasis, they modeled it to try to get between 50 and 80 percent inhibition of TIC2, and the drug was remarkably effective. So what I'm showing you here at the top are three different doses, three milligrams twice daily, six milligrams twice daily, or 12 milligrams daily. And what they found was at that level of inhibition, that there was a posse 75, which meant about 75% clearing 
um, in about 75% of patients um, was effective at, at, at 12 weeks. And this is about two to three times better than any other oral drug that's actually available on the market. Um, but it also achieved uh, POSSE 90s in the range of 45%. And these are, are, are um, uh, clinical scores which are approaching that of the biological therapies that I described at the very beginning. So I think this actually is very encouraging that this therapeutic hypothesis will indeed play out and will also benefit patients. Okay. So if that's the model, an allelic series model, I've given you one example, TIC2, trying to say it's important to not only pick the target, match modality and mechanism, and use that to guide the amount of inhibition that you desire. What are the resources that are required to make this kind of more, um, uh, more routine in the way that actually drug discovery is done? And I want to describe uh, two to you very quickly. Um, the first is, is the idea of Mendelian randomization. I think people are very familiar with that. Um, you know, it's nature's control, randomized controlled trial, and so that's shown on the left where you have two different groups, an intervention group and a control group. And in Mendelian randomization, you're not randomizing based upon drug. You're actually ra randomizing based upon alleles. And what you want to find is that allele um, that actually is present um, that may have a, you know, a higher effect on the biomarker and a higher effect of, of, on disease risk. So what are the tools that you need in order to make Mendelian randomization a reality? Um, you need this causal pathway, genotype to intermediate phenotypes and disease outcome. You need data, genotyping data, sequencing data, functional data as shown in the middle, and ultimately clinical outcome data. You need to actually do the relevant studies. So this first is a quantitative trait study, genotype to biomarker. The second are genotyped to clinical outcomes, so the, the, most of the GWAS that have actually been done to date. And of course, human epidemiology is important as well. And you can establish then these causal pathways. And ultimately, if, if, it's, a, if it's along the causal pathway, there'll be the genotype, the intermediate biomarker to disease uh, phenotype, and that will all, all line up. But what's important is that you know, increasingly, it's not the genotype, the clinical phenotype data sets that are limiting. It's these quantitative trait phenotypes that are limiting, including um, functional assays that David described, protein quantitative trait low size, and I'll describe those in just a minute, expression QTL levels, uh, metabolomics, et cetera. Um, so this is a study that we did in collaboration with Adam Butterworth and John Dinesh and colleagues. It was published a few months ago in Nature, and it was a large protein quantitative trait loci study done in for about 3,600 plasma proteins and over 3,300 individuals from the interval cohort. A very large number of PQTLs were identified. That wasn't necessarily surprising. Um, but shown on the right is an example of one um, at the at a locus uh, IL-6R. And I think what's interesting about this is that the, 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 the allele that um, is protective is associated with higher amounts of soluble IL-6R, but actually associated with decreased amount of membrane-bound IL-6R, which consist, is consistent with the therapeutic hypothesis that preventing IL-6 signaling via an antibody, tocilizumab, as I'll describe in just a moment, should be effective in treating um, uh, RA symptoms, as, as an example. Um, and so again, it puts it along this causal pathway, uh, and the therapeutic target, therefore, should be neutralizing um, uh, the soluble portion uh, uh, or IL-6R uh, directly. And again, that's actually shown here for a drug that's approved for rheumatoid arthritis, tocilizumab, that mimics the effect of the mutation, again, by inhibiting IL-6R signaling. Okay. In the last few minutes, I just want to briefly describe phenome-wide association studies as an emerging resource. And again, this takes advantage of the ability to look at the pleiotropic consequences of alleles as, as they're identified. Um, a few years ago, I think people probably weren't not as familiar with this concept of FIWAS. Uh, a lot of the work that Dan Roden and Josh Denny and, and, and Marilyn Ritchie and others did at Vanderbilt really, I think, pioneered this field. And it's increasingly becoming sort of a car common, commonplace in, in, our, in our vocabulary. But just describe the approach very quickly. You take a cohort, a large cohort that's a disease agnostic cohort that has very rich genetic data and also rich clinical data. And you can then merge those two and take variants of interest and now look for the pleiotropic effect of a variant on a wide range of phenotype as opposed to the reverse, which is often one phenotype and a large number of variants. Um, 
You can then, again, use this VWAS approach to look at the pleiotropic consequences. And going back to that allelic series model that I described earlier, you can use those phenotypes as surrogates for, er for surrogates of efficacy uh, or surrogates of, of, of toxicity. And again, this would be one of the tools that would be allow you to establish these, these dose response curves. Um, so I want to highlight one example very briefly, um, a gene IFIH1. Again, I'll refer you to Shomari Chaudhary's paper from um, uh, earlier in the year, uh, fine mapping um, uh, RA and type 1 diabetes. And again, there are multiple alleles that uh, are uh, protective in terms of risk of type 1 diabetes in particular, um, but also RA. Um, and one haplotype in, in particular can be used as a tool in FIWA. So you can find a tagging SNP for this particular haplotype and take that into a, um, a large-scale um, FIWA study. Um, the study actually, I say in press here, it came out today in Nature Communications, and it was a FIWAS in about 80, uh, 800,000 individuals from a, a number of population cohorts. Um, we tw tested 25 um, variants that were established as as uh, reproducible genetic associations, and we tested these across over 1,600 clinical endpoints. And 10 novel associations were discovered, um, one of which is shown here for a gene IFIH1, also known as MDA5. Um, IFIH1 loss of function variants were known to protect against a number of autoimmune diseases, including vitiligo, type 1 diabetes, and psoriasis. Um, but the question then, from a therapeutic hypothesis perspective, is what happens what happens when you inhibit that particular gene um, and what uh, adverse events might you expect to, um, uh, un uh, to um, what, might, what, what adverse effects might, uh, might result from that inhibition? And at least this fee wash approach might suggest that there'd be increased risk of, of asthma and also ulcerative colitis. So it's worth noting that the effect size on that same variant for asthma is much smaller than the effect size, say, for, for vitiligo. So, so maybe there is indeed a, a therapeutic window. Um, unlike the TIC2 story that I told you about, there are no clinical compounds that inhibit IFIH1, so this is a story that will have to play out over the next uh, several years. But again, at least it highlights this, this concept of these function phenotype curves, this, this concept, this model of allelic series, and using this as the starting point for a drug discovery journey. Um, I just want to highlight one emerging resource, that is uh, FinGen, um, which is um, uh, uh, recruiting uh, up to 500,000 individuals uh, across the company, uh, country of, uh, of Finland, uh, and you'll hear more about that over the course of the meeting in the next few days. Um, so I just want to finish up um, just by summarizing the, the points that I, I made. So first and foremost, um, not, not only does the pharmaceutical industry use genetics, I would actually argue the pharmaceutical industry needs genetics. We need a way to actually deliver new targets, to drive down costs, and to deliver innovation to, to people who need it. Human genetics, as you heard from Matt yesterday, increases the probability of success by at least twofold, and in some cases even higher than that. I described in a little series model and how you can use genetics to pick targets, think about biomarkers, think about effect size, and also select indications. I gave you an example of TIC2, which is proving uh, to be a, a, an example that, that's worked in the clinic, and then also described uh, emerging resources for Mendelian randomization and, and FIWAS. Um, so with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions, but I think we'll probably move to the panel discussion. But... Thank, you. Thank you very much for keeping to time. So um, uh, any burning questions uh, before we move to coffee break? We do have a panel discussion later on. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. TIC2 seems like a really good example. You kind of mentioned the disease combinations, but I'm just wondering, I would like to hear your opinion. What if a psoriasis patient develops arthritis or asthma? What is the approach to address that if the mechanism is not the same? Um, so, sorry, ask, ask it one more time. I don't know if I totally followed the question. So, so for psoriasis, for, for TIC2, multiple different autoimmune diseases, including protection from psoriasis, and then IFIH1, a different gene, um, had uh, increased risk of, 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 of asthma and protection from other autoimmune diseases. So I may right. have missed your question. Yeah, uh, just certain, uh, there are disease combinations. It's not as straightforward as there is one you know, pathway yep. leading so on, because I know that certain percentages of psoriatic patients have psoriatic arthritis and so on and so forth. So yeah. things get complicated. 
So does this mean that you're in square one when yep. you uh, uh, face the yeah, so, so I think the short answer is that genetics is not, it's not, it's not going to take that probability of success to 100%. It's still hard. <laughs> you know, if you can double or triple your probability of success, that will really drive down cost of drug discovery. So it is still hard. It still takes a lot of work. And there's still uncertainty, but I think that probability, it is very clear, at least to me, that is doubled, if not tripled. And so um, I think that's the main message, is it's still, still hard. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your talk.